Absolutely. Hey, what's going on, guys? So I'm a political strategist. I run Florida's largest Web3 Chamber of Commerce. Uh, one of the first, I think the first state Chamber of Commerce specifically focused on Web3 and Bitcoin. And so now, in case you didn't know, there's, I think, about 40 different state chambers of commerce throughout the United States now, all kind of advocating on the state level. And of course, we got about three... Man, actually, that's a lie. We probably have around five or six different federal chambers of commerce either advocating for Bitcoin mining or the Bitcoin industry at large, all with kind of different big players. So I talk to all those people coordinating on different policies and political strategy. And I got linked up with Gary because uh, we're both Florida guys, love Florida, both in the Tampa Bay area. And uh, we just want to start making some real political change. Um, I think there's a huge need for it. Uh, even though a lot of people, I think, are politically involved, I think over the past five years, what we've noticed is there's just a there's a clear lack of strategic thinking. I think that problem's slowly being solved. Um, you're seeing more entrance in the space go, hey, you know, it's time to kind of wake up, but. Uh, you know, we're kind of in the midst of obviously a presidential election and obviously a lot of other elections this year. It's going to be very interesting just because of what's going on in the Senate. But election years are the best years to get politically involved because if you're looking at it from an investment perspective, the money you're giving candidates during an election year is critical and important. If you're looking to gain influence and really help these people become Bitcoiners, pro-Web3, you do it, or it's best to do it during a political year because then they know you have their back, they're going to have your back. And that's just something that I don't think the industry's done enough of. So Gary and I are actually going to be doing a uh, fundraiser here shortly for a congresswoman in the St. Pete area, which we'll have links and, and flyers for you guys. And I just posted a tweet that I'll, I'll post in the spaces, uh, which will include a link for you guys to go and donate to her campaign. But that's really the goal is to start really pushing uh, hard. And I think we have the opportunity and the willpower to do so. Uh, and I think Gary and I are just a great team on that front. And, of course, we're going to be doing um, more spaces, more YouTube, you know, more talking. I just filmed some for for the YouTube channel today. So if you guys are following his YouTube channel, you can expect to see me on there uh, with some fun political content. I got to remember, I got to remember what I talked about today. I think I was actually talking about some of the political strategy around RFK Jr.'s presidential run. I know, I, I just did the videos today. How am I already forgetting? I see some of you laughing. Um, but when you're making content uh, as often as we are, it does, you kind of get lost in the weeds sometimes. You're like, oh, what? Was that yesterday? Was that today? Uh, I can't even believe today's Thursday. I'm still kind of fascinated that today is April. Um, so pro, who is that? Prometheus, I see you got your hand up. What's going on, my man? What's up, Samuel? Thank you so much. And Gary Kaka, thank you so much. Like you guys are doing something so important. All right. Like the whole world is vested in your elections in the, in the elections of your amazing nation, by the way. Okay. A nation that could have... Uh, pointed the gun towards every illegal that came over the border, but has the compassion to tolerate this levels of people and still, you know, humanely send them back, you know, or, or incorporate them as much as they can. I don't think people realize how much America does for the world in just like little things like that and big things like that. Anyway, guys, please retweet this space. This is going to be amazing. All right. I, every time I hang out uh, with this crew, like we, we have a great time. So good to see you. Um, I just came from your brother's amazing virtual growth conference as well. That was phenomenal. I loved the Arnold conversation. I know if you uh, had a chance to hear that, uh, Gary. Yeah, no, I haven't. Uh, but he always does a great show, man. It's one of the best shows I've ever been to in my life. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it was phenomenal. I, I was blown away. Uh, Samuel, did you have a chance to check it out? No, no, but I kind of like Gary, I hear lots of good things. And of course, it's it's what? It's in Miami, right? It's down in Miami. So I always know a lot of people who go there or go to it. So I just, uh, one day, one day. Oh, you, uh, I'm going to try and make the next one, man. It may be the last. Who knows? That's what <laughs> G, GC was saying, <laughs> Uncle GC. <laughs> 
where are you based out of Prometheus? Are you, uh, you're not in the United States? No, I am in the land of the Brits, uh, where it's very cold and we have a lot of tea. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm in Canterbury. Uh, I don't know if you've ever come to the UK. I've been to London uh, just once, but I actually I had two friends visiting me here in Florida um, last week, and I was trying to teach them how to water ski, and they, they weren't able to get it completely, but they'll be down again soon. They want to move here, and then, then they'll become true Floridians once we get them up on those skis. Yeah, but did you take them in the awesome. Gulf, or did you take them in a lake? I took them in a lake. I took them okay, in a lake. That's, it was that's, a chain of lakes. Yeah, that's good training. I've had people... Oh, yeah, let's go skiing, dude. And they take me in the middle of the gulf. It's like, oh, that's a lot of fun. Thank you very much for ripping my entire body up. <laughs> well, and cl like classic non-Floridians, the whole time they're asking us about alligators and whether oh, they're yeah. going to get eaten alive or not. We're like, nope, you're fine. Yeah, well, that's how I learned how to ski. Uh, was in Lake Charles, Louisiana, next to a refinery before the word uh, ESG was even thought of. Uh, toxins were considered, you know, the shit you put on your cereal. And, I mean, literally, we lived across from the refineries, and we would, uh, Grant and I would get on a boat. I mean, these are true stories. I should write a book on, like, the amount of insane things he and I did, and yet we did not die or end up in prison. But we would literally get on the back of a boat doing probably 30, 35 miles an hour. Oh, that's fast. With, with uh, shorts on. And uh, we would jump out of the boat, and we would see how many times we could skip, right? <laughs> oh, dude, we, we were like crazy. I mean, we, would, we learned how to ski in little tiny tributaries where you didn't have to ask if there were alligators, dude. You're looking at them. Yeah. So, like, you became really good because, like, falling was just absolutely not an option. Uh, yeah, totally, dude. It, like, you just treat each other. <laughs> it, it was it was horrific. It brings back. Uh, I mean, you guys think riding Bitcoin? So try skiing with my brother. It, it's 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 an nice. <laughs> oh, I would have loved to seen the alligator scenes. That that sounds wow. <laughs> we we were really scared of the snakes. It was the the moccasins that like man those things they get on you. Okay, guys, we're not talking about skiing, though. We're talking about Bitcoin. We're talking about finance, markets. Uh, Sam, since you're here, and we'll get to your hands. You guys don't have to raise your hands. If you want to speak and you have something, just, you know, bounce in here. You don't. You can just lay, lay, lay down your hand. Uh, what was I gonna, did you see the announcement on the physical ETF being released in Germany by Galaxy Digital? Uh, physical ETF. I saw the announcement, but I haven't even read the the article that you posted. Okay, I'm going to put it in the nest because I think it's like, like just the good news keeps coming. Uh, I mean, like the other thing we did today, Sam, that you didn't mention was we had a chat with Vivek and uh, one of his business partners. That was interesting. Talks in politics. Talks in business. Uh, he's looking very fresh, by the way. Didn't you think he w he was looking really refreshed and rejuvenated? Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, it takes a toll being on the campaign trail. I mean, having to be active and you know really be positive, uh, it's it's tough work. So I'm sure it's almost like a relief to be able to be behind the scenes a little bit more. Oh, dude, he looks so different than the last time I saw him. Uh, and not that he looked bad, okay, but I think people underestimate how much what a toll it takes when you're doing 18 hour days um, and and the variables he had to deal with the chaos was uh like i think that was a probably a good training session for him oh yeah i mean uh what do they call it by fire um whatever that's saying trial by fire. yeah trial by fire one of the best ways to learn but i think he did a fantastic job i'm excited to see how his business ventures go i mean really i think he's if he's got the um, dedication to stick out a presidential campaign and then still kind of be pushing on the political end, I have no doubt whatever he does business-wise is going to be perfectly well. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'd invest behind him for sure. Well, in fact, I think I did, didn't I? So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, and I don't think that was a waste of money. I mean, I, no. like, and guys, just, just so that you know, because we will post this about what we're doing for the congressman, I've not asked anybody for money on anything okay 
I don't really even know how I'm going to monetize this. I'm sh I, I, I hear people making suggestions of how I'm going to do it and good luck because I don't, I haven't even really thought about it. But one thing that I do think is important is if you own Bitcoin, like throw a dollar, ten dollars, a thousand dollars towards some poly, towards some people like me and other people. That's why I that's brought awesome. Sam on to help influence the message to our politicians. Okay. There, there are so many different ways to pitch Bitcoin. I have a unique way. I think I can communicate with these people in a really cool way. But if it's not me, man, give it to Bob. Give it to Sally. Give it to Larry. Make sure that we're educating young, progressive, by progressive, I mean forward-thinking politicians who know that you and I are going to vote based on their financial, fiscal policies and how they look at war. Because I don't think anybody in this panel or listening here, wants to go to war. We don't need war if we get our finances fixed correctly, okay? This is just about everybody and their brother going insane, and they're all blowing you and I's future, and I feel like I would be committing a mortal offense to humanity not to at least try to do something. So, I mean, I gave 100 grand to, to Vivek's campaign, just to get his voice out there, man, just for some fuel. So I try to be extremely transparent where I can be. And I'm just asking you guys, like, if you're into Bitcoin, just do something politically to protect your investment, like an insurance policy. Most of these are tax deductible anyway. So you guys are in the money, especially you guys selling those tokens, making all that money, 50, 40 percent capital gains, push it into uh, some political influence. Yeah, I just uh, I put up a tweet by Dave McCormick. So Dave McCormick, just FYI, is running for uh, Senate in Pennsylvania. And that tweet is him visiting a power plant, a 20 year old power plant that is now mining Bitcoin right through the waste reclamation process and even mentions it in his tweet. And I don't know. I don't think. Any Bitcoiners, to my knowledge, have come out and supported his campaign, have donated to his campaign, but it's obviously such a big and important issue for this guy that he's doing it organically, and that's a really, really good sign. And whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, and Pennsylvania is going to be you know, fascinating to watch because it's one of those swing states, it brings a lot of attention not only to the industry, but it shows you how much influence you can have. Because the talking points that everyone loves, clean energy, clean jobs, clean high-paying jobs, are what these politicians want to hear. They don't even need to necessarily understand, you know, Bitcoin and Lightning Network itself. You can just say, hey, this is what this is doing. Here's people that it's employing, and they get it. Because those people who it's employing are voters. And so that's definitely going to be part of our mission and part of our goal is showing these people that, you know, hey, if you support us and you make this a mainstay in, in kind of your campaign and are friendly to the industry, obviously we want to support you. Yeah, awesome. Hey, SFAC, uh, happy to have you come up. But when you're when you're not talking, if you could unmute your phone uh, or mute your phone because we're getting feedback. What you got, buddy? You got something to say? Come on up. Yeah. Hey, Gary. Hey, Sam. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, a third world country Bitcoinization in Brazil? Can, say the question can you again, say it again? Third world country in Brazil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what, what's your question? What about a third world country or Brazil? Yeah, how about uh, Bitcoin in Brazil? What are you guys thought about the demonization of our currency? What are you guys thought about that? I mean, to be honest, I feel like that's like anything anything else. I think you're going to see a lot of these countries, especially in South America, who notoriously struggle with high inflation. Um, you know, I hear all the time that kind of in America, we have the luxury of not dealing with the inflation that other countries have, which is why maybe Bitcoin adoption is a little bit slower here than it is in South America. I see that all the time in Miami when I go down there. A lot of the people who have come to Miami from South America are very skilled and know what Bitcoin is uh, because they've had to use it to secure their literal livelihoods. So I think places like Brazil and Argentina um, especially, but then I think I was even seeing something about um, in Colombia, 
I think Bitcoin adoption is going to continue to grow. The biggest question is whether the politicians are going to get behind it or not, like they are in Central America, like El Salvador. I, look, I think I think these countries that are getting eaten up with uh, being at the very tail end of the supply chain, you know, not be, i.e., not being able to create their own money, you know, that's been taken away from them. Uh, so, look, those to me, those countries really need Bitcoin more than perhaps U.S. citizens, and so some of that will drive some demand and i have not meant to be uh negative small users retail or small countries but my perspective has been look this real adoption and speeding up mass adoption only comes through the largest you know countries in the world large institutions that's why i've been so supportive of wall street getting involved once that happens this goes really viral uh you just don't pick up large addressable markets though going country by country slow by slow uh, and sadly these people are using bitcoin to buy goods and services which is such a waste this should be a part of their savings program not a spending program but there's a and that's the other reason i wanted to get get involved with politics because i think the education on around the world i mean just what i've learned from doing this for six or eight months and the questions and fear and concerns and thoughts about money and finance, uh, guys, we have been grossly, grossly miseducated, miseducated, not undereducated, grossly miseducated. And uh, I find it really interesting that I'm 66 and find myself talking about this thing called Bitcoin. And at the same time, it's making me aware of a lot of social issues and one of those, and I think one of the most important is, is education. Uh, man, we are so screwed up here. Uh, it's really sad. So, so uh, yeah, that like on Brazil, good, man. Y'all buy Bitcoin, okay? That's what you should do. That's awesome. Buy Bitcoin, hold it, and then go make some fiat and turn it into Bitcoin. Same strategy for us. Yeah, you're right. Thanks very much, man. Go ahead, Prometheus. I see you got your hand up. You can talk. No, just to briefly chime in, because I think this is such an important set of points that you guys raised. Um, inflation is such a huge issue uh, world over, and especially in South America, which has had you know its economy messed with for years, right? Whether you talk about you know the insane loans from the IMF to Argentina or um, uh, just just across the board, right? Like they've they've so for a co small country like El Salvador to have a Bitcoin balance of over five thousand or five. 5,700 or whatever, they no longer need to prove to creditors, right, that, oh, is, do we have a, you know, a balance? And uh, it's, it's there. It's there for the whole world to see. And so what's it doing? Like, look at uh, Naib, who's the uh, prime minister, a uh, young prime minister, uh, m might I add, like 40 years old, you know, um, look at his policy and look how... Um, that has brought in investment it ha and also he's you know he's taken a very radical stance at making his country safer so just in the context of brazil and you know so many other south american countries i think bitcoin is a godsend uh, i think uh, what gary was saying was absolutely true that this should be a savings mechanism not a means for payment use freaking eth or one of the other you know one million other meme coins to, to to do that okay like keep your savings in btc right i think that's the power of interoperability if we can get that down to the ground including using the digital uh, networks and phones and whatnot so just wanted to make that quick point um i had a, I had a tweet shared by some of the south american press exactly on this point but yeah, it's it's uh, it's a, it's a godsend considering inflation. You know, it's amazing to me that I'm still arguing with uh, old time Bitcoiners on this uh, thing about like using Bitcoin to buy potato chips, and 
they keep defending it. It's like, hey, no, we need we need the transaction flow, and it's like, uh, you know, my garden does not need a trickle of water. Okay, I might as well not waste that little tiny trickle. It's it's I need to actually irrigate the entire garden uh, properly, and 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 in, in the right sequence. Right? Maybe I, my garden's too big. Maybe oh, I need to yeah, reduce sense. it relative to the amount of water I have. But to go use this for potato chips, man, or an automobile, like it, it it's mind-boggling to me, especially now because we don't even have to do that. We can let Wall Street. Germany's going to roll out a billion-dollar ETF, man. Okay? That's real adoption for the Germans to get a piece of this action now. So to me... Someone's going to look back and go, wow, I spent, you know, $3,000 on a, on a bag of potato chips. And it won't be long. It could be like four or five years. You look back, that's just such a waste. You would never educate anyone on that, right? Or you would never suggest to somebody, hey, go, go rip off a little piece of, uh, of that goal and, and, uh, and sell it unless it's like a dire emergency. Uh, so, again, I just think that's a bit of a... Maybe, maybe a, a, a almost a disrespect to me for for Bitcoin at this stage. I, I'm not saying it's like the peer to peer thing is going to be a deal. I just don't think it needs to be the deal today. Once that product, once the commodity settles down in value, unless you can constantly hedge it. I hear people go, "Hey, look, I buy a bag of potato chips, and then I immediately go replace those satoshis." It's like okay. Okay, that's cool. I mean, I guess that's cool. It seems like a lot of work, but um, anyway, just it's such a valuable product. Okay, just just to waste it on a, on a bag of potato chips, unless you had to. And, and uh, I don't know anybody in Brazil that had to eat a bag of potato chips. Hey, what's going on, Yellow? You wanna? I see you got hey. your hand up. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Samuel, uh, Gary. Uh, talking about potato chips, um, I have a, a small uh, family-run uh, business uh, around banana bread, um, a bakery down in Latin America, and um, I love what you're saying, your, your advices and all that, that wisdom you have, and I would, I would like to maybe, um, I don't know, get like some kind of uh, feedback of like, I'm really thinking of like, I don't know, the sales are very down lately on banana bread and I'm, I'm like feeling like leveraging the business and buying more bitcoin i know i'm like i'm not i'm like a small fish uh you know the stuff you guys talk but like uh what would be uh, should like smaller businesses try to do the seller thing a little bit like if they can at some point or should they not what, what would you advise you mean like using your own business to hold Bitcoin on your balance sheet? Is that what you mean? No, maybe like I can do that, but like I can, I can, I can take a loan on the business or something, something like that, and buy Bitcoin. What's money cost you down there, man? Money uh, is uh, devaluing all the time, more no, and no, more. But, but but you said you could take a loan out on your business. Yes. So yes what, what, let's say you could take ten thousand dollars out on your business. What, what what would it cost you to borrow ten thousand against your business? Oh, okay. Yeah, they charge a lot. Yes, I know. Yeah, see, see, that's the right. See, the, I think the right answer is: Is there ever a right time to leverage your business or or your family or yourself to buy anything, including Bitcoin? And to me, the wrong answer is no, never. That's what I heard when I was a kid. I think the real answer is, well, what's it going to cost me? If it costs me 1%, dude, I will, I will borrow 5,000% of my net worth if I could borrow money at 1% because I know that I can put that money to work. But at 15% um, or 20 or 22, that's what I think you're probably going to be at. You're better off just getting all your credit cards paid off and not paying that debt, it's just too expensive, man. I just, I just blame the carrot bread uh, cartel here, or something, you know? <laughs> thank you, thank you for your time, guys. Yeah, pleasure to have you. If you guys want to come up, follow Sam, follow me. Uh, 
request to speak, ask a question. I love these questions. I think, the, like, if I don't know or Sam doesn't know, somebody on the panel is going to have a good idea. And I will not give you bullshit, okay? We'll find somebody that knows, if it's a good question, that knows the answer. Um, Sam, have you... Um, get bring up a little controversy here but you know ethereum is somebody brought up ethereum earlier and ethereum is like really really uh slow playing their rollout you know their 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 move into this bull market and i'm starting to hear more and more and more suggestions that you know ethereum is going to lose its track to bitcoin um, and I started thinking today, I'm like, you know, if Ethereum would never been around, how big would Bitcoin be today? You know, I think um, uh, and this isn't necessarily a correct opinion. Right. But just some thought. Um, I think Ethereum took a lot of the weight off the Bitcoin network because people were looking for something to build other cryptos on. And Ethereum gave that opportunity. It let people just use ERC20 and kind of make all these different kinds of tokens and Bitcoin, if that had been done on Bitcoin, it would have completely, at the time, I think, slowed the network. Now you're at the point where Bitcoin, like DeFi protocols and side chains and different layer twos are going to start launching on Bitcoin now, finally. And so now, and meme coins, I think, last cycle, a lot of them were on Ethereum. Now they're all on Solana. <laughs> I'm seeing all the meme coins on Solana. And I'm not a I'm not a trader at all. Uh, so like I'm kind of talking out my ass, but I'm just letting you guys know like what I've seen uh, just over time and being in the space and so long. So I think Ethereum's here to stay, but it is interesting for me to see just uh, some of the difficulties that they've had with their network because of their popularity. But now if Bitcoin comes back and people are saying, oh, Bitcoin DeFi is the next big thing. I think that is going to be really important. I haven't seen a lot of hype or the real hype cycle around Bitcoin DeFi yet, but I've started seeing more and more accounts talking about it. So I think it's it's very likely that we start seeing some building on Bitcoin like we saw some building on Ethereum the last two cycles. But only one way to find out, right? Yeah, it may just be about, you know, the, the sequencing of how people roll out, because I agree with you. I think Ethereum took over the, hey, let's handle the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, but I, I maintain peer-to-peer -peer will never, it's not going to be big enough in short order enough to build a business. And so once the ETFs really flow, we re like nine months from now, 18 months from now, I can see peer-to-peer -peer being much, much more important. It, it, with Bitcoin, I, I just think that the staging of this, this is going to repeat the MySpace. We're going to have a lot of MySpaces, dude. AOLs, Time Warners. There are going to be names all over the crypto industry that thought they were going to be the leader, and, the, and they will not be. I, I do not think Bitcoin's one of those, but I don't think there's any safe spots below Bitcoin uh, until this market really matures. Dr. E, how are you, sir? I'm doing good, brother. How are you, man? Thanks for having me up here. I see uh, Saved America. I think he had his hand up. I don't. I appreciate you calling me out, but um, I, 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 I prefer to let him go first if he's been waiting. Go ahead, buddy. He's already had his voice. He can pop up right after you, man. All right. Appreciate it. Well, I just want to ask a question, man. I love that you always talk about Bitcoin and you give a lot of good information on you know uh, the crypto space, but I want to ask you if you've been dabbling or looking into Solana, I just heard you guys talk about Ethereum and how, you know, it ha it's potentially going to have an ETF and all these things. But, you know, with the Solana blockchain and gas fees, all those things that Solana has, it's attracting a lot of, um, what's it called, new investors, right? Um, and I just want to ask if you've been messing with uh, Solana or if you hold any Solana or if you, you know, have dabbled into meme coins or anything like that, just... Just wanted to hear your input on Solana since you, you've been talking about Ethereum as well. Well, I own 11 Ethereum. It's probably 11 too many, in my opinion. Um, I do own some Solana. Uh, I say that with a caveat of I own a lot of Bitcoin, guys. Okay, so anybody would be very happy with my... I'm the only one that's unhappy with my Bitcoin position. So if you're hearing me, I'm not going to... 
I'm not going to lie and I'm not going to hide from you guys. I do own some Solana. Uh, and I've made a good bit of paper returns on it. Uh, I own some mining stocks. These are all very short trades for me, though. Okay, I will be out of Solana within 10 months. I will be out of all the mining stocks, and I will continue to acquire Bitcoin. So these are really different trading strategies. I've been doing this my whole life. I may not use a wallet as perfectly as everybody thinks I should, but uh, th these are bets for me, man. And I think most people listening to this, they'd be a lot better off just loading right up on into Bitcoin and going back to their day job. Like I, don't, I, I don't have to have a day job, okay? So Absolutely. 100%. I mean, th you're talking about dollar cost averaging, you know, and if people would just focus on the big picture versus the micro, you know, scopic picture of Bitcoin, man, they're going to be well off in 5, 10, 20 years because Bitcoin's here to stay, you know, um, and, and it's, it, it's two just cycles, man. It's two cycles. You know, it, it's literally eight years. If you're just walking into this party, if you just look at and go, hey, look, I'm 32 and I'm going to be 40, eight years, that is a very short term investment. Okay. Yeah. You, you get into a real estate deal with my brother, he locks it, you up, and this is not a bad thing, but you're in for 10 years at least. Okay. You have no control over that investment for 10 years. This is simply an eight year cycle. And uh, you'll take a dollar and turn it into eight, man. Yeah. Well, no it's interesting. Every cycle, you know, I think the last cycle, what was it, 10x, if not a little bit more? And people don't realize that, you know, people will jump into meme coins and other, all these other projects and lose so much money. And if, and if they would just like dollar cost average into uh, Bitcoin, they would be very happy. And, and you know, because it's, it's amazing what you can do with, with Bitcoin. I mean, you're, you just said it yourself, I'm, a lot of people would be happy with my Bitcoin bag, but I'm not because you understand the value behind it. You know, I was talking to a financial advisor, a uh, patient of mine. He's just like, and I was just picking his brain. I was like, so what do you think about Bitcoin ETS? And we just like nerded out. And we were talking about how the general public doesn't understand the value behind it. And it's honestly, it's a hedge and, a, and, and it's going to be used for major transactions. Like, you, what your brother does you know um i mean does your brother make transactions in bitcoin for for uh for no, no 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 he doesn't accept bitcoin oh no he that's how he got into bitcoin i think somebody gave him 100 bitcoin he oh, sold okay. he gave 15 of them away for uh he bought something that yeah. was a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar. no that was a million and a half dollar mistake i think he bought some software or something uh but that's uh yeah he, somebody gave him See, and I've always said, hey, look, Grant, until you buy Bitcoin, you don't really own any Bitcoin. I mean, you, you own it, but you ain't going to understand. You will never understand this until you put your hand in your pocket and spend some money on Bitcoin. Um, and I just don't, like, I do not understand until you're loaded up with so much Bitcoin why you would even play in any of this other stuff, right? Um, but it explains why the... the uh, lottery business is so big in the united states biggest lottery year ever it goes up every year the odds are ridiculously bad uh yet it continues to happen and i think it's the same people playing around with the memes and uh, so i really try not to talk about them but i'm not going to say that i haven't looked at it and participated and look I, I can be a degenerate just like everybody else okay greed fear uh, but the, 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 the phenomenon is people think this is going to be a get rich, easy, quickie. And there is no quickie about this. Um, I, I, you know, and I think that I, I just would like to see people buy Bitcoin and go to work. Yeah. And if you talk to some people that have been around a long time, guys my age, they'll tell you, hey, I wish I'd have mowed more grass and made more money eight years ago and invested in Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. that, that's their big trading mistake. They're like, dude, I shouldn't have looked at the charts. I should have been out mowing more grass and making more money. So let, let me ask you this. You've probably already answered it. Like what, what sparked the light bulb about Bitcoin? Like what brought you in and made you believe, man, this is here to stay? Because you obviously believe in it. Uh, 
Well, I've always wanted to, I've been competing with monopolies my whole life. And I thought it was really unfair. I've always had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about the big companies. And I thought it was pretty unfair that, um, you know, British Gas or Exxon Mobil or back when they were a monopoly, a real player. Uh, you know, if I asked you today who the top 10 oil producers in the world are, most people would make the mistake and list a bunch of U.S. Exxon Mobils. They don't even make the top 10 list. If I would have told you that 30 years ago that Exxon Mobil wouldn't even be in the top 10 of oil producers in the world, just shows you how much has changed in 20 years. You, you would have said that's never going to happen. Uh, but they don't even show up on the list. Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is when I was 30, I realized that in order to really do well in this world, you needed to really own a monopoly. And if you couldn't own a monopoly, then what you needed to do is figure out how to partner up with one, hijack them, and figure out, you know, hey, how can I make a business out of, you know, a cottage industry on the, on the side of you? And if you can't partner with one and you can't buy one, then you need to go beat one up. And uh, it's what I call death by a thousand cuts. A bunch of small guys like me in little tiny boats with a little capital, you know, 10,000 cuts against a monopoly will sooner or later start to leak out uh, blood and, and, and fat. And, and I don't need much, right? So I remember talking to a guy at British Gas. He said, hey, how much do you think you can make? Uh, doing what you're doing in, in Britain. I said, million a year? And he scoffed at it, right? He's like, oh, dear boy, we made three billion pounds net last year. Well, he didn't understand that, one, I was probably not giving him what I thought I could make on the top end. Secondly, he forgot that, hey, what if, what if it's 10 million and there's 100 companies making 10 million? Now are you interested? And that's what he didn't understand. He did not understand the network effect. And I think that's why I'm so pro uh, Bitcoin, because I've seen the response from the legacy for 40 years. I know how they respond, and governments are responding exactly as they have in every other industry I've been in that was undergoing massive disruption. And that's the point I was trying to make on the ExxonMobil thing 20 years ago. No one would have said ExxonMobil will not be in the top 10 list. And now they are not in the top 10 list. So, you know, the entire payment rails were completely forgotten in the World Wide Web. Amazon, Google, Facebook, all these brilliant guys, did. they missed that communication is actually currency. And in order to, like, do the Internet properly, you need ability to move current, currency, communication in forms of monetary value or value exchange between multiple people or people how could all those brilliant surges miss that man so we're all underestimating the impact of change as we roll out and i think we're going to really underestimate the speed by which the snowball just spins up and speeds up i would agree a hundred percent um uh, the real capital when it comes to like a lot of these major funds um, and, and you would know this better than I would uh, it hasn't even come in yet right like this this is just the like the appetizers when it comes to like how much can actually flow into this economy um, the, uh, we could see like a ten trillion dollar, twenty trillion dollar market cap in our in in the next five ten year horizons. I don't think those are unrealistic numbers. What will be the price of Bitcoin then? Right. Uh, I, I love Michael Saylor's recent tweet where he put zero point zero seven mil <laughs> is the current price of Bitcoin. <laughs> You know, just he, he's he's a brilliant troll, um, you know, and and so I, I think that we are at the early stages of a um, a, a global uh, 
currency that integrates economies we're, we're seeing it now already but it's it's going to go to another level um it's going to integrate and in, and intertwine us and make us it's almost like it's a conquering the tower of babel problem when it comes to currency uh, that's that's what bitcoin has done um we're, we're no longer uh held to a central bank's whims you know like if, if people want if you want to appreciate why bitcoin matters so much study normal monetary mechanics okay study how it is you know this 34 trillion debt to whom did they have the capital to begin with or did they just invent it you know henry ford used to say if the ordinary people would just understand monetary mechanics uh like there would be a revolution the next day so that's that's what i have to say about that gary i think uh i love how you say communication is currency because i 100 percent believe that and it's <laughs> It makes it very interesting then when some of these platforms actually try to limit speech and limit communication. So I think there's there's something to be said there. Uh, Save America, I know you've had your hand up for an extremely long time, so appreciate you waiting on us uh, if you have anything to say. And guys, don't forget to leave any comments or retweet the space uh, so more people can see the conversations that we're having. So Save America, go ahead, man. What you got going on? Hey, hey, man! Thanks for uh, thanks for letting me up. First off, I didn't realize I could put my hand down, so sorry if um, it was just sitting up there for a really long time. Uh, it's your that, rotator cuff, man. Said, <laughs> right on, man. Right on. Um, yeah. So um, I actually I have kind of like a two part question. Really, um, I, I had something on the more political side in mind. Um, or yeah, hit me. Yeah, more political, but uh, you guys, everything you were talking about with Ethereum and Bitcoin and um, just kind of the differences of that, it did inspire a little bit different of a question I wanted to start off with. So um, Gary in particular, because you were talking very specifically about uh, Bitcoin versus Ethereum, and I wanted to get your opinion on um, whether the ETFs, say if there's a, you know, there may be a ruling that the SEC might make Ethereum a... Um, might say it's a security they might delay or just completely reject the etfs for it but with um what with, with what's buildable in a decentralized way on ethereum um do you think that it would be really be a make or break because it allows innovation to really be democratized so it could be you know it's almost like a again the, the web3 a, a new type of tech boom that's really anybody in the world can uh, have a piece of it. You don't just have to raise VC capital. Yeah, I, see, I don't see that's the the question so complicated for me that when I look at Bitcoin, man, I'm just such a simple guy. It's like, dude, I don't have any of those issues. I don't have any SEC issues. Yeah. I don't really think that if that's Ethereum's problem that they're going to be claimed to be a security. I don't really get that that's going to destroy their business if they have a good business. And they provide a good service. Um, it's just going to fall into a different tax bracket, and regulations are going to be different. That's that's it. So I don't, I don't really understand the big issue. Uh, I don't think Ethereum is a commodity. I've been trading commodities my whole life. It does not look like a commodity. It's de definitely, most certainly, not decentralized. There is an address I can send yeah. to a foundation, um, and I, I just like when I have the choice, dude. I, I get to buy Goldfinger. I, this is James Bond product, and I'm worrying about another thing that might move a little faster. And I just n have not seen that prove out. Uh, so it's like being dumb is really good for me. It's like, hey, I picked my winner. It's Bitcoin. Let's roll. Now, yeah. now I'll listen to people like British or somebody else that's really smart, and maybe they convey me and convey to me, hey, look, man, here's a stock. It's the next Nvidia. Or etc. But like, what's the market cap of Ethereum? And I compare that to a, a Nvidia. I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't think so, man. I'm not paying three hundred billion dollars for that. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, yeah, it does get kind of complicated with that. I mean, I think what what a lot of people just being as <laughs> balls deep into it as I can be, um, you know, it, it really comes down to first there was the memes, obviously, which much more have moved to Solana, but Solana doesn't have the same capability as Ethereum or first mover advantage in terms of uh, currencies that could 
become, uh, or not become, but currencies that are made to be a utility insofar as uh, Ethereum currencies are made, you know, they have the tax and it just, that's that's kind of the thing that that's that does become a dilemma because it is all on Ethereum. So I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Um, uh, secondly, though, yeah, Samuel, good. Go ahead, sir. No, I just wanted to add very quickly that the biggest thing is that Ethereum doesn't have an upper cap. There's 21 million Bitcoin. That's it. Right. Same with Solana. You can print these things like, you know, like as as many as you wish. Right. And it's it's only market dynamics that are, you know, um, ensuring it's it's, you know, rarity. It's it's technically not a digital scarcity. Bitcoin is a digitally scarce. It is it is it is digital real estate for that reason. One hundred percent supply, and supply and demand. The supply is infinite, so you can just print out more money, just like the good old U.S. dollar. Um, Gary, you you brought up some history earlier, and uh, you know we came off the gold standard in what nineteen seventy one. Do you think we'll ever see a Bitcoin standard? How do you define ever? Uh, maybe our lifetime. Uh, I hope not, man. I hope not, because that means my children are going to go through something that's going to be awful to get there. But your lifetime, look, guys, it took 52 years for Visa and MasterCard to get everybody with a credit card in their pocket. Junked out on this shit, right? Uh, so I, I think it, we, we underestimate how long this takes. Uh... But it could, like, if you got a couple, if we went to World War tomorrow and there was a reset five years from now, I guess you could you could see Bitcoin in a basket of things. But, you know, if we're lucky, we'll see Bitcoin in a basket of other things. But I, I'm, look, I think we got to make it through the next, we got to make it to election. And then we got to make it for the following four years, because that's going to be tumultuous no matter what happens, I think. And that's just, that should that's beg, really beg really yeah. positive for Bitcoin, in my opinion. That kind of tumultuous uh, environment. Uh, speaking of the election, I did want to kind of have a follow up because I, I had a friend. I had a friend actually tell asked me to get on here um, because of the discussion you guys are having. Um, but how much? do either of you gary or sam uh know on politify and what's going on with that the new kind of like sector of DeFi that's been blossoming over the last several months not too much i mean you want to educate me i have some friends who um are very interested in starting um some quote-unquote lobbying DAOs, uh which is obviously uh i think a very cool idea but very very touchy uh, because the you know the elections commission federal elections commission does not mess around, and as soon as you get into um, campaign finance law, I mean you think the SEC scary. Uh, those guys are scary times ten. So um, I like the idea, and I've seen some ideas and frameworks shot out there, um, but no, I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen something specifically called Politify. So you want to maybe update me? Yeah, man. So, um, well, first off, you know, just this uh, platform in and of itself, I, I did want to, I do want to be respectful of it. Um, but obviously you see, like, I have a Trump profile picture on my thing. It's called Save America, right? So there's a little bit of a, um, a an obvious, uh, I guess, a gender aside that would be there with that. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of an actual community, and I just want to be very informative. I don't want to come off as something that would be shilling. So first off, I'll just start with the PolitiFi aspect in and of itself. Um, over the last several months, uh, there was some Trump coin that did really well. And it started off a whole new sector of not necessarily memes, but the majority of them were. And then uh, this community started, there was a team that put together um, an Ethereum token in and of itself that raised directly it essentially it's autonomous so it has like a burnt liquidity 
it has um, an automatic tax function written into the code. So every transaction, uh, 2% automatically goes to Trump's Ethereum wallet. And it's, it's fully decentralized and autonomous. So it's really, um, it's really an innovation in grassroots fundraising in, in the vein of kind of like what Bernie Sanders was able to do in a more, you know, you would say traditional sense because he started more with uh, social media, getting a certain younger demographic. Uh, what's kind of gone on here is one, Trump has a crazy amount of crypto fans. That's just a, a huge track that's pretty known uh, industry wide. But, um, you know, a lot of people saw and had issues with um, what was going on with the, uh, with the judgments and the rulings. And, you know, they know that they're able to help out directly with those particular things. Obviously, a campaign might be a little bit different um, or direct finance towards a campaign or anything like that. Um, but really what this was and has become is like a, a grassroots innovation, which it, it even there was a tweet about it, about the project itself that was just on John Oliver the, the very last weekend. So, I mean, it's kind of something that's, it's got the stages of beginning to go viral, but it's the first utility in Politify. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that really hasn't been seen before. And, you know, there is a branding aspect to it that's not as important. But, um, you know, they have the, the ticker of DJT, the same thing as his stock. That's a huge branding um, aspect in crypto. There was like a GameStop GME coin that on Solana that went to like an 80 million market cap. But that's, that's not really the purpose or the mission and what, what has um, galvanized people behind it in creating the community that's uh, begun. But it's really the innovation and the tool behind it and the, the aspect of, you know, speaking on a GameStop, um, just to touch on that situation, there was a huge uproar over the whole uh, Robin Hood shutting, shutting things down to, to help out their own financiers. And um, so the decentralized aspect of it kind of takes control out of any person's hands or even a political system as to where, you know, via Bernie Sanders, you kind of see him get, uh, you, you see things happen within the Democratic uh, Party's system and their primaries with the superdelegates that really kind of fucked him over in his movement because of a centralization of power. So, um, so I, have a, I have a real yeah. quick question for you because I, um, I would see some red flags that I would just watch out for, but just very quickly, I know Trump oh. launched NFTs. Uh, he... How would these people have gotten his Ethereum wallet address? And how do you, like, verify and trust that? Yeah, so... Um, hey, kick guys, up. can we do something? Because I, I actually find this to be really boring. Um, I'm not interested. I mean, I, look, there's going to be... We could... And, and no offense to you, sir. I just don't think no, that... No problem. You know, I'm already coming up with stuff like Trump... Trump token. I don't know. Just... I. Um, Look, I'm, I'm here investing many, 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 many millions of dollars form. in Bitcoin, yeah. and I'm really trying to help the, the industry understand. I'd love to hear, you know, about some crazy shit that's going to spew out on Bitcoin. Or, but see, some of these, yeah. th some yeah. of these carnival tricks, man, that, that's just what they look to me like. They're not long-term investment strategies. I see British, but it is, dude. It's a carnival trick, right, British? British, you're going to put $3 million into uh, into Trump token? I mean, I could probably can't even get you to come give me a thousand bucks for for a congresswoman's dinner, right? Like, why would you invest in that? It's not going to get a return. It's huh? a complete and utter circus. Well, well, I, I, I could tell you, I'm not going to go on a tirade defending. Gary, the only reason the altcoins exist is because people have an activity bias, and they can't sit on their hands while real money takes over the entire world. Even though every single blockchain project that every company has tried to start ends in it ends in absolute horror because a simple Oracle database is better at managing whatever the bullshit that blockchain experts want want people to manage on a blockchain. Secondly, they don't understand that you don't need to decentralize everything. Most things work better in a centralized way that is absolutely the incentive of profit. You need to decentralize money because that's very, very important. Uh, but 
most things don't need to be decentralized. So this is a it's it, and the ETFs, the launch of the ETFs in Bitcoin will demonstrate. You know, they've tried to call it a fancy altcoin season, but as you said, you know, the the ETFs and the capital flow is now going to demonstrate how much of an altcoin circus this whole thing is. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll hop off. Uh, I just want to close it with just hey, a quick listen, statement. I don't, I don't um, think we're saying you need to hop off, man. We're not, and we're not even being offensive to you, okay? This is, all we're okay. saying is that there's an opportunity. I just want to make sure I'm not, I'm not like, oh, disrespecting oh, the platform, because I understand how it could come no, listen, to you. Dude, right? everybody gets to do whatever they want to do. I think British will agree with me. You can invest your money however you want. I just see a once-in-a-lifetime yeah. experience, and I think what British said was, we, we are seeing a phenomena that humans have a problem with, and that is sit on your damn hands and don't do anything. Go read a book, man. Like, that's what Bitcoin offers me. And it's really hard for me. Yeah. It, it is so hard for me to sit on my hands. I am programmed to think I have to be in action. But, bit, see, I, can't, I don't have that opportunity with any other asset in the world than Bitcoin. That's what I love so much about it. So when I start hearing about all these possible opportunities like bitcoin is my private equity investment opportunity i get to buy into a business that has no human error issues none it has an addressable market that is endless okay the bubble is the entire planet and all i have to do is grab one this is exactly the way i invest in companies and then go run them and build them hey what's the addressable market oh a trillion dollars dude all i got to do is get one half of one percent of that that's literally the way I looked at every business I've ever built. I get a tiny fraction of 1% of that industry and I'm gold. Dude, I get to buy like, you know, nice little percentages of Bitcoin. It is a business that has no regulatory risk, no monopoly regulatory risk, yet it is absolutely a one of a kind. Therefore, it's a monopoly for that definition. Um, and no human, no management headaches, no board meetings to go to, fucking no K1s to get. Like, nobody sends letters yeah. to anybody. It's awesome, dude. And if you haven't built businesses, if you talk to some private equity guys that have built businesses their whole life, and they really get this opportunity, like, like I want to hold a meeting one night for some old guys that have been around since Bitcoin was 100 bucks, and then they decided to take that $100, 1,000 Bitcoin, and then go build a business, everyone will tell you that was a monster, monster mistake. Okay, monster. In terms of getting a return on your capital. So, I, I, I learn from other people's errors, man, and my own. This is, And that's what I'm trying to share with you right now. This is a once-in-a-lifetime yeah. opportunity. 500 people listening to this. You can own your own business in Bitcoin. And if you self-custody... You're in total control of that company. Absolute total control. When you enter, when you exit, you don't need an investment banker to sell it. You don't need an accountant, except you probably need my software. And that's it, man. So find me a better business opportunity than that for my family. And I, I get to invest it along with my, my family. And I don't have to force my kids into a management business that I liked. But they're like, shit, dude, I don't want to do uh, real estate. I want to do something else. It's, it's just endless opportunities for Bitcoin. I can't be excited enough about it, I, I got to tell you. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, first off, you know, you're at a level like even myself personally, I have a couple of Bitcoin, but you know, the, the level in which you and obviously your brother are operating, that's a, that's a place for most people in here to aspire to, of course, right? Um, I think the, the conversation more so about um, just what I was talking about the upside, because I'm not going to argue with anyone on volatility. I mean, Bitcoin has volatility too, but it's not the same as everything else is much less established and the majority of it dies. It needs to have a real long-term value proposition. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue that in any way. Um, I, I would say more so what, what I was kind of uh, getting to and Sam, you know, you can check the the account or send a DM if you want uh, the verifications. We have a telegram for the actual proof of the wallet. That's a different discussion. Um, it's more so what you were saying earlier about like supporting Vivek um, in, in the other aspects we were talking about in, in just being politically active and seeing, you know, 
uh, supporting people that have your interests at heart and the needs that you identify with and you think will help you financially and, uh, you know, community wise. And as far as uh, most people just even in, in the world, uh, owning one Bitcoin, even now, it's not going to go back to where it was. So it's, it's just difficult. And I wouldn't say that anything is a superior investment because it's everything else is much more high risk. But as we've seen with, um, with Trump's actual stock of uh, Trump media, you know, it's, it's insane because they're talking about the whole meme stock 2.0 thing. And, and it has probably the worst financials in terms of any of the meme stock situations uh, of previous ones that they've been comparing it to all over the mainstream media. And uh, more so just uh, to, to touch on the, uh, the Save America on Ethereum, the DJT on Ethereum, um, not so much, I'm not going to sit here and say it's this, uh, stressless, stressless, uh, easy passive income thing. That's a guaranteed rocket. Although it does have great fundamentals for the market it's emerging in. Uh, what I will say is what they're calling the actual DJT meme stock that's being propped up is activist investing. The majority of people that are holding that up and have, hey, say, say, uh, hey, man, value. I, I tried to be, yeah. I tried to say, I, I, I just don't want to go down this deep rabbit hole. I mean, we, we've given you quite yeah, a bit okay. of time. Happy yeah, yeah, to have you in the you. audience. And, I got you. and, but I just want to say one thing because you, you made a comment about me and my brother and we're another level, okay? The, the reason I keep yeah. pounding on Bitcoin is because I'm quite certain. You do not have, and I'm just making a judgment here. I could be wrong, and you can correct me, but well, let me just say it this way, okay? My brother and I got rich because we took massive consolidated positions, okay? We did not spread our seed all over the place. And I'm going to, like, if you study history, okay, great wealth is made from taking all in place. Like really going all yeah. in and being extremely convicted. There have been many people who have gone bankrupt doing this. Okay, the Hunt boys were right, and they went almost bankrupt on silver. So there's plenty of uh, skeletons and carcasses all over this planet from people doing this. I have been doing this my whole life. I am far more comfortable doing this than my brother. Okay, he he, he has very little risk, if any, in his real estate play. There is risk in this, and I am going to put all consolidate all that risk into Bitcoin because I don't have any time duration issues, which is a really important thing to consider yeah. when you're investing. Um, so, so you know, when you say, "Hey, you and your brother are at different level," yeah, we got here the same way too. We we put it all in, dude, and, yeah. and that's the way you're going to get rich. You're not going to get rich by having thirty different investments. Um, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't. I was saying more as an, an aspirational thing in in regards to, I I wouldn't. You couldn't even buy thir, uh, three million dollars worth of uh, the whole DJT on Ethereum anyway. That's that's kind of what I was yeah. alluding yeah. to that with because it's it's not well, that. Yeah, it's, it's nowhere near the market cap. Yeah, I got you, you man. Hey, listen, we're gonna get to some other hands here though. Okay. No hey, worries, British. Man. I'm going to get down. I appreciate it. Bruce, what's going on in the market today, man? What are you seeing and the, kind of the sentiment and any any uh, intrinsic flow data that's relevant or important to you? Yeah, I think what's what's actually important is something that I, I, I learned a few days ago and I've been thinking about it. And that is that I didn't realize that ultra high net worth individuals actually have a significant amount of their portfolio in alternative investments. I was of the mindset that ultra high net worth individuals actually have their wealth in TradFi assets. But it seems like what's going on is TradFi assets, because of the saturation <clears throat> of capital in them, have become the exit liquidity uh, for ultra high net worth into high net worth. So someone who's worth $100 million or more is in alternative things like private lending, private equity, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, art even, all these other alternative assets, because you have to do that with the amount of capital that you have to generate the return that's wor worth the risk that you're taking. And then in order to generate liquidity, you IPO that asset, 
or you sell that asset to a to a group and in the process of IPOing that asset, who's buying it? It's really the conglomerate of high net worth individuals, not the ultra high net worth. So when you when you take that into account, then you realize BlackRock has been studying Bitcoin since twenty seventeen. It kind of makes sense because they are ultra high net worth asset managers. So it seems to me that the ultra high net worth individuals are actually more open to Bitcoin than I had previously thought. It seems to me that we're going to skip that middle class of rich, right, which is high net worth, and they're going to get their wealth shredded because they're in real estate, right? When you study people uh, who are 500,000 to 36 million, the majority of their wealth is in real estate. Um, and it seems like that is going to be the wealth tax that is imparted upon uh, people and further uh, and to further expand the wealth gap that is within the United States. You know, when you study the really wealthy people like what your brother is doing, your brother is in real estate, but he's not really in real estate, right? He's in the real estate facilities business, which is the private lending and the alternative side of real estate, which is the high leverage side of real estate. So, yeah, it's fascinating to me that, you know, ultra high net worth individuals might actually be more more open to Bitcoin uh, than high net worth individuals. And, and people have to start taking this into account because otherwise they're just going to be left behind. Yeah, dude, I to this is what, what I keep saying about it. I think this happens at the wholesale level first, like our next adoption level. There's 406,000 families that are worth over 30 million. And some of those are worth a lot more than 30 mil, right? The, like the volume that's going to come in British is I think in two and a half million dollar slugs minimum for these fam families and 25 million and a hundred million. Um, I get these phone calls all the time. Hey, want to make 17%, you know, really unique strategies. And it's hilarious. Cause I'm like, nah, dude, I'm just going to do Bitcoin. I drive, I drive every one of them crazy. Um, but but that's to the point of the, the guy prior to me, you know, I look at Bitcoin and go, OK, these guys are smart. They got this history and everything, but I got to pay a fee. I got to get reports from them. I mean, Bitcoin's just such a safe play. But British, how long have you been watching Bitcoin? I don't think I'm I don't think I know how long you've been around. I've been around since really in earnest. Twenty one. Yeah, no, for me, I, I saw Bitcoin in 2016, thought it was a complete scam put a little bit of money in, doubled my money in two weeks and got out and smoked cigars with it. Uh, but it was really April of 2020 after reading the Bitcoin standard and after very, very serious people in, in my world and, and life started telling me about it, that I, did I start taking it seriously? Yeah. Yeah. When I started seeing people from wall street move, people that I respected, I was like, uh, I need to pay attention to this. Yeah, for me, it was a friend of mine who's a lawyer, and in 2016-17, we were all joking about how Bitcoin was a scam and watched this thing fail. And then in 2020, he rang me and he said, uh, I'm buying Bitcoin, and I need you to read this book, uh, And I, because we used to both be into gold. And I just laughed, and he said, no, 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 what, stop laughing, read this book, and then call me back. And it was just the tone of his voice that just made me take him seriously, and then the Bitcoin standard did the rest of the work. Hey, since you've watched gold, I know you've watched you, your family was in real estate and you've watched commodities. Uh, what, what do you think is going on with gold and silver right now? What, what is the uh, their movement upward telling us? I think it's telling us that people want hard assets at this point, right? People want security. They want hard assets. They're feeling a little bit uneasy right now. You've got hawkish. Fed chairs coming out and being dovish. You've got dovish Fed chairs coming out and being hawkish. No one knows what the absolute flying fuck is going on. And I think people want some security here. Uh, and that's why, you know, gold is, but gold ultimately is an impotent asset. I know, you know, as much as Peter Schiff likes to rave about it, it's up about 11% this year from what I remember. Silver by itself, it's the, 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 the greatest scam with silver, and one thing that I fell for until the light switch went on was, when you study the stock to flow of silver, like how much silver can you dig out the ground? It's a reflexive stock to flow ratio, and it can go from 15 years, which is it means it takes 15 years to dig up as much silver as on the ground right now. And it can take if you if enough money goes into it, if it goes up to fifty dollars, 
the stock to flow of silver can drop down to three years. You can dig up all of the silver that's on earth inside of three years if the price approaches $50. That is why the price has never broken $50 because the supply just comes rolling in. Uh, and the same thing with gold. We haven't stretched the imagination with what's possible with gold if we start breaking $10,000 an ounce. And these guys don't want that to happen. The gold gold sellers don't want that to happen because they found a great business model, which is make one gram bars, attach a 40% profit margin to it and tell people they need it because the world's going to collapse. Uh, and the truth is someone handing over a hundred dollar bill for, you know, uh, an ounce of gold needs to see that gold go up by 40% before they start breaking even. That's the biggest scam in the gold space. And that's what's unique about Bitcoin, because I can take 50 bucks, put it into Bitcoin, and I'm actually getting almost 50 bucks worth of Bitcoin. Yep. Can't do that on a little tiny fragment of silver or gold, can you? Valkyrie stamps their name on it. And then, like, literally, guys, they're saying, you're paying. If the gold price is 2000 and you can buy a gram of uh, gold, especially with any kind of logo on it, that's going to be, did I say 2000 uh, That's going to be $2,800 to you. Gold has to get to $2,800 before you're going to get anything out of that trade. It's such a scam, dude. In Bitcoin, I can sell a tiny fragment, and it costs nothing, right? I, I can just shave it. It's... The more, I, the more I use this shit, the more I'm like, my God, man. Yeah, Gary, think about it like this, right? The person who is living on the street begging can buy the same asset as the person who is working a middle-class job, who's buying the same asset who, of someone who's a multi-millionaire business owner, who's buying the exact same asset of someone who's worth multi-billions of dollars. The only difference is, is that the fee that they're going to pay is going to range from you know, 0.5% to 3%. That's it. The rest of the asset is the same. This is the first time in human history that we have an asset that you can actually do that with. Yeah, which is the, those same people. That's why they're standing in line to buy a lottery ticket, right? They're standing in line to make the American dream, to hit the f freaking home run. And they're paying a huge premium for the lottery ticket. Take that $17 and buy Bitcoin every day, guys. Like, I cannot believe the people standing in line to spend 17 bucks on a lottery ticket. Uh twice a week i'd love somebody to know do the math on that 34 bucks a week for four years how much bitcoin is that at eight thousand dollars had they been doing that four years ago it's it's people don't understand compounding british i mean it's they don't understand math or how businesses are executed it's it's really sad how we've grossly miseducated our our communities man it's like disgusting I believe it's purposeful, but that's a whole different conspiracy theory we can talk about another day. Yeah. DJ, what's up, man? What's going on, Gary? Good to hear you. Appreciate that you're doing the hard work and really educating so many people with this, right? And I love seeing you learn more and more and get more conviction. Um, it's really beautiful. And, and you're not the only one, right? Like... This is happening all over the world right now. People are flocking to Bitcoin because they understand its safety. Like, it's like everyone still thinks in the investment world it's a risk on asset, but everybody who studies Bitcoin more and more by the hour, they understand it's actually a risk off asset. It's the safest play. And I really don't look at it as an investment. I really think that it's actually a savings. And this is for the first time in history, other than gold, um, because, you know, the gold standard broke, but Bitcoin hasn't. At least not yet, and it probably won't for hundreds of years until a better technology comes along. So I really think that like that's the biggest difference that a lot of these people just don't understand yet is that it's not about investing anymore. We finally have a way to actually save. And that right there is gonna be the crucial thing that people are gonna start realizing. And like you said, right, thirty dollars for four years. I'm on DCABTC the website. Let's do five years. Three years ago starting five years ago. Um, that $30 today would be, so your total investment would be 9,396. Your total value today would be $36,914. That's a percent change of roughly 300%. So just $30 a week. I think everyone in America can afford $30 a week. 
anyone who's working. Um, so it's life changing money for most people. And it's, it's not an investment. It's a savings. It's the first time in history that we can save. So I just have a question for you. Do you see more and more people studying Bitcoin now, like in your league? Or are people still thinking this is an investment and they just go straight to the ETF? Uh, well, I, don't, I, I can answer that. I can answer that. I can answer that. Go ahead. Yeah. So I finally got my dad to get into Bitcoin because we... I bought two miners from Bitmain like a couple of years ago, just have them running in my basement up here in Canada. It's heating the whole house. They're giving 50 bucks worth of Bitcoin per day. And because we have like the carbon tax and whatnot up here now, the heating your house is just so fucking expensive with Trudeau and shit. So no heating bill, getting paid $50 a day. And like last month, I think you put, you know, a good amount of money into iBit the BlackRock ETF, like, he finally gets it now, right? Like, my boomer dad, right? So it's, like, just, sh like, showing people how it works, like, just convinced him, you know? Because he's just so used to equities, just, like, American stocks, like, just doing options, right? So, yeah, that's that's my take on it. Like, just, you can convince people, man. You just need to teach them. They just don't know. Is he studying it at all, or is he just going to trust uh, the oh, investment well, idea of it? He, you know, he's still trying to understand it. Like, you know, most older guys, like, they, they're not tech guys, right? Like, they just don't see, uh, you know, the value in, like, software and, you know, like, <laughs> NVIDIA or whatever. Like, they just didn't buy into it early, right? Like, they're just not yeah, tech I, people. I think they struggle with it because it's not a tangible asset, you know? And then right. their argument is always, well, it's not a tangible asset. It's not gold. You know, I can go buy a gold bar and this and that, blah, blah, blah. You know, where, where's my Bitcoin? You know, and if you really educate a person, it's like, look, dad, I'm going to send you a Bitcoin. Pretend I'm sending you a, a, a bar of gold, you know, from here to Canada. You know, you can't do that. Oh, yeah. The velocity of it is just like Bitcoin's just lightning quick, so liquid, like. There's no, like, you don't have to move it, like, you know, physically. It's just always, it's just always there so quick in our digital world. Like, it just makes sense. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think you, he's finally getting him, it, right? Like, have you well, sent I mean, him, have you sent him to listen to the Robert Breedlove and Michael Saylor series? Cause I oh, think yeah, no, I mean, really yeah, I show him the Saylor. Excellent. Yeah. yeah but he's like, I when think he DJ, said your digital point. Manhattan, he's like, what the fuck? I think to your point, <laughs> DJ, thanks, man. Your point, DJ, is I think. The more people invest here, whether it's through the ETF or however they get in, Coinbase or direct wallet to wallet, uh, the more you invest, I think the more you look at it. So, And I think yep. when you have a win from it, um, <clears throat> and I think the, the best way I've gotten people into this is just send them 200 bucks worth of Bitcoin or, or 1000 if they're, you know, a political guy. Here, man, here's $1,000 of Bitcoin. You want to talk about it for 30 minutes? That is you know a great line opener to one grab 30 minutes get somebody's attention let the price go up you know 12 percent and then go have a chat with them so uh i study things i'm interested in just because i don't study things i'm not interested in doesn't make me better or worse it just makes me not interested in certain subjects who else we got yeah. up here david then we got funny then we got a couple other guys hands sam you got anything you want do Gary, can I just, can I just make no, a quick No, we're all point? good. We're all good on my end. Gary, can I just make a quick point about the whole, you know, we must force boomers to learn about Bitcoin. The most beautiful application of Bitcoin will be when it's being used in the financial system and nobody knows they're using it. That will be the single most beautiful application for Bitcoin. So as far as I'm concerned, I, it doesn't matter whether boomers learn about it or not. You buy the ETF. Get them into it. Right now, Bitcoin is a store of value asset. We must show and demonstrate its value as store of value in order to get to the next stage. If someone's dad, mom, grandma, grandfather, whatever, just wants to buy the ETF and not give a damn about what Bitcoin is and how it works, that still adds value to Bitcoin because of the dollar they're putting into the monetary network. Bitcoin is a monetary network, not a philosophical network. So all the happy hippie bullshit about we must teach people how to use Bitcoin to hug a tree and buy coffee 
can go out the window. We need their dollars. I need people who hate Bitcoin to put their dollars into it. Because the only thing that matters is how many dollars are inside the monetary network. That's my opinion. Gary, I've got to take off. Uh, for Buddy, thanks for being here, man. I, I, think people you, mis- I think people misunderstand people like me and British. We've been in markets so long. It's just like, hey, you guys want the sugar coating or you want the real story? <laughs> and when there's an experience or an opportunity like this, like what you want, Look, what I want is I need $15 trillion of value in Bitcoin. Once this thing's bigger or closing in on gold, dude, this will get everyone's attention. And then this is the Trojan horse, okay? Like, it, it, we've had bad strategy here, uh, just bad strategy. We, greed will drive so much desire, okay, and competition, so... Uh, we, we definitely need price to work. I don't think that means that we're just animals and all we're about is an investment. Uh, but markets don't work and people don't get interested unless there's something to fucking talk about. And price is the deal. Um, we're getting ready to find out how important price is. I mean, go ask somebody in, um, let's see, what country we want to pick? Any country that's not the United States right now. Their dollars are getting crushed. Or let's go talk to the Ukrainian people. They, they don't even know what they're, who they're going to be working for, man. Uh, so, so that we need, we need all the, we need four hundred and six thousand ultra wealthy people buying ten million dollars worth of this shit. Somebody run that math. Four hundred and six thousand families buy ten million dollars, which would be less than what I have in Bitcoin. Okay, so they only put ten million dollars in there. Uh, run the math. Okay, it is a tremendous amount of money. I think forty trill, and I could see that happening. Couldn't you, British? Ten million for four hundred and one hundred percent. Fuck, dude, all day long. Hey, get. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you when you're talking, man. Hi. Um. Yeah, I I totally agree with British's um hypothesis that. It's going to skip over like the 5, 10, 15 million peop- uh, person kind of cohort or group and go straight to like the super rich 100 million dollar group. Because I, I, I don't know anybody really in the 100 million group, but I know a good amount of people in like the 5, 10. And every single one of them is obsessed with this thing of cash flow. And they also have gold and they're just like in this weird old paradigm. And everyone I've ever, every one of those people I've ever spoke to is like Bitcoin. They're like, they said that thing is going down. They like, they have all these weird preconceived notions um so just kind of i I feel like you gary probably know more people than that ultra high net worth is are you finding a much more openness to it because i don't have you know access to that 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 that, uh, class of people but from my my point of view of the middle yeah they don't care about it at all which is so bizarre to me because even british was saying like he didn't even you know uh think about this beforehand but yeah so just yeah, I, I tell you, I, I don't think, I think less than 1% of the world's in this, okay? Um, and, and I think there is a something real accurate as to what you said about there's a generation of people that really want cash flow. They're into real estate for sure, right? Um, but they want cash flow. They want dividends. I just laugh at that every time I hear it because I don't want... More what do you cash say flow. Because, like, when when I brought it up to some people, I know they're like, you know, in the millions. Well, the first thing I do is like, I survey them. Yeah, see, but see, I'm not trying to sell anything to anybody. So, like, it, it, I'm interested in two things, dude. Here's a guy that's worth a hundred million dollars, and he doesn't know anything about Bitcoin, and then he doesn't listen to me. I'm like, okay, survey done. Thank you very much. Put that guy in a category, and then you go meet another guy, same age, same bracket. He's got a different situation, and he gets interested. Like, for me, I'm not trying to make someone go to the Bible and, and get religion. Um, I can survey all these people and learn and start to learn, hey, what's going on? Like, like where are they in the adoption phase, right? This is an adoption event. You, you can't force but it. They, but when they say, like, if it doesn't cash flow, it's not useful, like, I always say, like, look, it's about the total kegger and it's beating it but they're like no it doesn't really matter if you're not generating a cash flow that i can value it from i never never really completely know what because they don't understand what cash flow is they were just sold the idea by some ad on the that's not dj that's not true man they're they're into real estate they they have loans 
they, they've never seen an asset like this. It's not really, it's very hard for them, even though it, you would think that the real estate guy would get this. The real estate guy, you have to remember, for him to buy $10 million worth of uh, real estate, actually, let's make it more relevant, $100 million worth of real estate, he only needs 15 to $20 million. But he has signed a contract that that asset must cash flow and meet certain thresholds or his loan, you know, breaches covenant. And that's what you're hearing about right now in the commercial real estate market where these covenant covenants are being breached and the bank's trying to, hey, I need, I'm going to take possession and they can't sell it, right? They're just rolling over because there's too many of them because they're not cash flowing. Those guys most certainly will go to Bitcoin because they're already not cash flowing. But it's just a different, I think it's a different investment. I think the real estate guys are going to figure out having Bitcoin in their portfolio actually helps them in so many ways until we get to a point where the banks want to sell derivatives against the hardest money asset that has mobility but I do think you're going to have to surrender access to your Bitcoin in order to get those kind of uh, the, those kind of deals, right? Because the bank can literally go seize the property if you breach the covenants of, of the uh, agreement made on the loan. Hope that that helps. But I, I just think it's about these people are going to come along when they come along, man. And, and I think it's the better you sell it, I don't think it's been sold well. Okay, I actually so hold true. people responsible, dude, for the for the people that sold it wrong. Actually, not that sold it well, but there were a lot of people that sold it wrong to me in 2016, and that cost me a billion dollars. What did, what did they? What? How did they frame it? Like in, in correct? Well, well, in first thing they did. I've never met so many people that told me what I should do with my money. I have never met so many people in such a short period of time that would tell a guy like me, they don't even know who I am, and they would literally say, you must do Bitcoin this way, and you must do this, and you should do this. That was one thing that was really offensive, uh, ignorant and offensive, I think. Um, I, I, so I kind of dismissed the crowd. There was a few people that spoke very well, Sadly, they got vocaled out by just the noise, man. Um, so you're talking about like the cult kind of maxi religious uh, side of it. Well, you know, it yeah, you that would have been one thing, but then it reali I realized it's not really a. There's some. Uh, I don't want to use that word. Uh, I, then I realized, hey, there's a lot of inconsistency here. There's a lot of misinformation, and that made me even more nervous. Uh, and I think there is a lot of misinformation around this topic and conflation what's, what's and conflation oh, there's tremendous amounts of conflation what's something you hear that's common mis misinformation um to even bring up the word token stable coin or meme in the same paragraph or book with bitcoin i think is grossly I, disrespectful I, grossly ignorant yeah, they've poisoned it. And, 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 and conflates so many subjects. Uh, it's ridiculous, man. Hey, uh, Gary, I can the, I... I think the other thing, people trying to force people into self-custody, monster, 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 monster mistake. And has, has, has pushed so much money away that could have been here and stayed here, but, but it was just too much. Well, I, I agree with that, but I think we didn't really have the vehicle, but now it's like we have this ETF, so it's like there's really no argument, you know, unless you think the federal government's going to seize it, which is pretty low chance, right? Well, I think they already have seized it, dude. That's what FTX and uh, Binance was about, so. <laughs> no, I mean, seize the ETF, it's a very low, I, I feel like that's a, just not a real risk. If you don't have any tech skills, the risk of you losing your keys is extremely high. Hey Gary, can I can I just make a couple points? Sorry, I just thought, um, is it all right? If, um, sure, man. I think you can. Uh, yeah. 
Excellent. So I think a couple of things that we sort of underestimate a little bit in that sort of, you know, let's say two to $10 million net worth kind of uh, bracket is the amount of liquid fiat that these guys have is actually not a lot. I mean, just thinking about being able to come out with even 500k to a million dollars to to take a bet on Bitcoin is extremely difficult if you're leveraged and your net worth's locked into sort of real estate equity, you know. So I think you, you kind of underestimate or overestimate how liquid that sort of bracket is. So it's quite difficult. And the other point that sort of really resonated with me, Gary, was... Well, hey, before, before we go there, though, so, yeah. so we're clear for the audience, because I'm only interrupting you because there's four or 500 people. So you're talking about 62 million people around the world that are millionaires, okay? So I'm assuming two and a half million dollars, okay? So you just make an assessment of how much would and will all those families do. I, I never suggested they would do millions. Take those 62 million people, $10,000 each. One time, one hit. Okay, you can't tell me 62 million millionaires will not allocate on average 10 grand over the next five years in their lifetime, one time, to Bitcoin. That's 100%, all I'm saying. 100%. But what I, what I was trying to back up, back up was British's point was actually we might miss the boat if you're in that bracket. You oh, know? they're going to get squeaked. They're going to get completely rolled over because they're going to have to pay three times the price for it. Well, exactly. Because the ultra wealthy are going to just bull in here, dude, with ten mil. Once they get a taste of this shit, okay, they're not going to go in with half a million dollars. They don't do that. Exactly, hundred percent. And 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 the second point I think you made, Gary, earlier was that I, you know, I'm hundred percent a believer that you actually wealth creation is is made through taking some really really high concentrated bets and going all in you know you create wealth by doing that you preserve your wealth if you like by allocation and that comes later but if you if you want to create wealth you've got to go all in you've got to have conviction on on something and it's it you know i've seen that time and time again and the other thing is that you know i i, I feel like you really get hardened as a hodler you've got to go through and make the mistakes and 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 you'll see that happening this cycle as well but if you've gone through about three or four cycles and you know i've made mistakes myself where i sold maybe about 25 50 bitcoin uh and was quite happy with making say 10 or fifteen thousand dollars profit um but really that that those lessons sort of harden you up over time and we're going to have to see people go through these cycles. Uh, and, and what I think is going to happen is, you know, the, the next cycle onwards, you get the hodlers get even more hardened. And as you start to get through these cycles, people are just not going to sell Bitcoin ever again. And you, 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 you can't do that unless you actually go through the pain of having learned your lesson uh, once or twice in the past. Um, and yeah, that, that's basically it. And I think the risk of you know not being in Bitcoin is far far greater than being in it really at this stage. Yeah, good words from a wise man. What did that fifteen grand cost you in today's terms, man? Uh probably Audience, about two drum mil. Roll. <laughs> drum roll. How about about two mil, you could say in today's dollars. Two million. See that that's important to look at. You go, whoa! If I had just you could have waited on that fifteen grand, right, eh? Well, I got carried away because I'm i turned sort of two grand to fifteen, right, at that time, and which yeah. seemed amazing. Yeah, but I'm saying you didn't need the cash flow back to that prior conversation. You didn't need to put that uh, in your pocket and spend it, right? A hundred percent. There you go. So whatever he's spending on, it cost him two million. That's that's real too. That, how, how long ago was that, man? Um, around about 2014. 2014, so that's yeah. 10 years. Hey, any of you guys like to make 200 extra grand a year? Tell me about cash flow. See, I've never done the cash flow thing. That That's what my brother would say. Hey, it doesn't cash flow. I invest in companies, build them, and then sell them. So, like, for 10 years, I don't make much money. And then I get a big payday. Uh, don't overpay myself on a salary. And that's that's bit, Bitcoin. Okay, I invest in companies. I don't have any customers that can fire me. I have no customers with Bitcoin that can call me up and go, you know, we don't like your position on Donald Trump. We're going to cancel you now. I don't have any lawyers. 
I, I, I'm telling you guys, this is an opportunity to own your own business. Ask anyone that owns Bitcoin and has built businesses. This is the biggest no-brainer in the history of mankind. Okay, I, I built a business called Chargebacks 911 from 2010 to 2020, 10 years. I was miserable four or five years of it. Uh, almost bankrupted my entire life to get into the business. That's how I learned about the chargeback problem. Uh, it was stressful. Cost me a marriage. I'll end up taking, you know, a couple hundred, 250 out of it. Okay, cool. But um, if I would have taken, I wanted to exit five years ago. I could have taken 10% of my exit. Okay, let's assume I exited for 250. I could have literally said, here, I, I just want 25 million, I'm out. And that $25 million would be worth four or five hundred million dollars today. And I wouldn't have had any headaches. I would have read a, a thousand books, not 300. And uh, probably wouldn't have cost me a marriage. So, like, when you start looking at the consequences and the risk associated with building businesses, you guys talk about the risk and volatility of, of Bitcoin. The risk of buying into companies or building companies, the human error risk is phenomenal, man. Mental, physical, somebody gets hurt, somebody goes crazy, guy gets rich, he goes crazy. Wife of the guy that's building the company is not happy because he's not making enough money today. She wants it right now, so he goes. I mean, the, the amount of problems. You get really successful, then the regulator comes after you. So, it, it, it like, when I look at Bitcoin, and, and I hate to rant about this so much, but, like, if I came to you tomorrow and said, hey, I can sell you a franchise for 70 grand, dude, guaranteed to make money over four years, Okay, in a way that's astronomical. It doesn't cash flow, but but you're gonna you know you're gonna wake up one morning and you're gonna own a franchise that's worth a million dollars. You're telling me you wouldn't buy a franchise for seventy grand, dude? I would almost go out and prostitute myself to make some money for seventy grand. I mean, I don't mean to say that. You know what I mean? I would do a lot though, dude. I'd dig ditches in the backyard for seventy grand to buy a franchise. And that's the way people should look at Bitcoin. You're buying a part of an industry that's worth $1.3 trillion. And that franchise market's going to explode. Because it's, it's the only franchise in the world that is truly global. Truly global. 8 billion people, dude. Not 800 million like Pi Pi's got. Okay, all 8 billion of us. That is a compelling way to sell Bitcoin, in my opinion. Can I interject here with something tremendously smart? Love it. Look, Gary, you've made tremendously smart points about Bitcoin. You know what the best point about Bitcoin is? With the state of New York trying to grab me by the assets, and that's what they were trying to do, believe me. If I had just had Bitcoin, they would have had nothing to grab. I would have hid it in a wallet. They would have not been able to try to get, get it. Letitia James would have been out of luck, and it would have been no deal. And I would have said, nan, nan, to poop, poop. You can't have my Bitcoin. It's in a wallet. You got no access to it. That is one tremendously powerful utility of Bitcoin. And also, did you hear about the whole thing with the government sending the Coinbase millions and millions of dollars of Bitcoin? And you know what the transaction cost of that was? A dollar and 48 cents. A dollar and 48 cents. That is less money than I can get my manservant check to spend at the dollar store for one of those candy bars. You know, after tax and everything, it usually costs more than a dollar these days. So for about the price of a shopping trip to the dollar store, they sent over millions and millions of dollars to Coinbase for Bitcoin. So, I mean, you tell me, what is a better asset than Bitcoin? Believe me, it is so huge, so powerful. By the way, I love the sound of your voice. You sound like Matthew McConaughey, but smarter. Gary, you're very handsome. I just want you to know that. You and your brother, I'm a huge fan of you guys. I love the real estate people. You're very smart. 
So I just wanted to come up here and say that. I love the Save America guy that was up here earlier. Tremendous guy. He and I do a lot of work together. So if you're ever in the mood for a DGEN crypto kind of play, check us out. We're fun. But your points about Bitcoin are spot on. It's huge. And you will never own something in your wallet that you can literally tell Letitia James and other people, and in the poop poop, you can't have it. Love it, man. Welcome to the team. Thank you very much for being here. Hey, usually welcome. I'm bullish. Usually bullish for Bitcoin. Also, you look at what BlackRock's building with their thing called Biddle, which is built on the Ethereum network. They're going to be tokenizing assets. So even if you guys aren't into the Ethereum okay, tokens. Okay, okay. No, no, I'm talking about tokenizing assets. I'm not ta talking about specific little cryptos. I'm just saying it's interesting what BlackRock is doing. Yep, they're going to be everywhere, dude. Yeah. They're going to be everywhere. Sam, how you doing, buddy? Good. Living the dream over here. My space is, is being a little in and out for some reason, so I'm not sure I'm hearing all the speakers. So I might have to hop out and hop back in. You tell me when that happens, and I'll pop you down because it does happen. Yeah, it's kind of weird because it just happens out of nowhere. I'm like... <laughs> yeah, see, just like just now, I pulled him down. I messed with these guys. David, how you doing, buddy? You been at 10X, I guess, huh? Hey, Gary, just for a bit of fun, I've put my what, some of my original transactions in the chat, just for a laugh, really. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you, man. <laughs> yeah. See, guys? That, see, I'll yeah. always remember him as the $15,000 man that uh, left opportunity cost of $2 million. And, guys, I have done the same thing. If I told you what my house is worth in today's terms in Bitcoin, it, it, would, it makes me sick to actually think about it. I want to vomit every day but there's always tomorrow um who was i going to call on david uh is david in in the house and derek i tried to bring you up but you for some reason keep bouncing <laughs> david you there buddy or you just you just want to be on the speaker stage sam you back yeah i'm back and i can hear everybody now there you go. Yeah, if that it does happen, dude. Like, uh, there'll be times when I can't even hear you, and I just have to, you know, wipe you out and bring you back up. Well, guys, if we don't have anybody that has anything to say, Prometheus, you got a you got a word? Got fourteen minutes. Let's roll. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm just thinking of like how to leverage this global community in such a way that we create an alternative economy right like it's it's time to take this newfound wealth and community and and you know focus it like a laser towards a vision that i think um we can get industry nations behind i'm i'm i'm, I'm in a different tangent I'm, I'm thinking about like yeah like how can we become like team humanity and solve the problems we're in how do you how what, what sort of what properties would you suggest to uh, channel that our uh, wealth to that vision? Like, yeah, well, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is food security, because uh, right now we have the likes of Bill Gates and, and many, you know, other strange types, you know, messing with our food. I'm sure you guys have seen how many food centers have gone up in flames, right, in, in recent uh, weeks and months, right? Um, I it's, saw we it, got the bird flu now, by the way, and apparently we were, I just saw a tweet, we were experimenting with how to transmit bird flu to other animals, and now all these chickens in the U.S. are dying, which pisses me off because I eat, like, 16 eggs a day, so... <laughs> Yeah, man, I'm I'm an egg lover too, bro. Like, no, it's it sucks, and we are. Oh, Boshan says he's fine. Oh, sorry, I'm talking about my brother. Uh, no, um, this there's there's a clear attempt to sabotage our food. Okay, so um, can we leverage this to make mass vertical farms, uh, near cities? Can we um. Uh, like use uh, this technology to uh, increase efficiencies in companies in terms of like um, you can you can you can pay your um, 
uh, employees uh, uh, out of out of out of crypto and then pay yourself back. Like there's ways to do this. I'm just I'm, I'm in a different tangent. I'm, I've been listening to the whole conversation like completely with you guys. But uh, for me, I'm I'm thinking like how it is we can become like a global you know network that uh you know bypasses traditional finance and essentially becomes its own you know food production its own energy production um education center just that's 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 where my brain's at decentralizing the money is exactly what's going to do that so bitcoin is doing that literally as we speak it's just a matter of people realizing it and understanding that and living their life freely we need like bitcoin tips on twitter just like quick easy Bitcoin sends like just a little balance in the bottom, you know. Like I'm sure they'll get there. You don't get there with it, but I think there there is already. Yeah, it's it's slowly, slowly getting there. We had a couple of speakers come up, and then we're going to shut down, guys. I think Elif, Lev, and Adam, uh, Neo, you got your hand up. Go ahead, you guys go. You don't need to raise your hand. Just pop in. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Lev. I'm uh, friends with Sam. I'm actually um, an author of a book that is published on a decentralized network called Ethereum. But today I wanted to tell you about decentralized publishing that is also possible on Bitcoin. So um, my story was um, I essentially worked during COVID. I opened over 50 COVID testing clinics and um, become very successful with that. And so unfortunately, there was some disagreement in between the founders and some of them had to skip the country, and so I wrote a book about it. And I wanted to publish it in a way that um, is decentralized, immutable, and can never be removed. So what I did is I uh, published it on ENS uh, by attaching, um, you know, essentially like an IPFS record onto an NFT. But now that Bitcoin has NFTs that are native to Bitcoin network, they're called ordinals. So um, I'm not going to, you know, debate too much about you know the pros and cons of introducing other technologies and different layers onto bitcoin but i would like you to view bitcoin also as an ultimate publishing tool where you can post um you know a string or, or a hash onto an ordinal that would forever you know forever be attached to a set and then that string can point onto a uh, decentralized website this is how vitalik publishes his blog posts on that ETH extensions, but ultimately you can use ordinals and Bitcoin network to publish your manuscripts, your thoughts, your whistleblower reports, and you know the things that you want the world to know that could forever exist on chain. So, with that in mind, uh, now you probably learned on you know a new way to use Bitcoin, and that is to create immutable publishing tools that are available to everyone and it's these days it's not as easy as you know as just wordpress but uh, we're working toward a way where any author or any person who wish to publish something on bitcoin network will be able to do so now it will require a little bit of uh tinkering and a little bit of you know blockchain knowledge and knowledge in how to use and build simple websites but in the end, if you want your voice to be heard and permanently recorded on a blockchain, something that is truly forever, Bitcoin is the right way to do it. Yeah, there's okay. going to be a lot of applications built on Bitcoin. I do believe that, Lev. Yep. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here, man. Thank you. If you're a friend of Sam's, you're a friend of mine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll give you a follow. Gary, um, I just want to make a quick comment. I know we've been talking about adoption. And I think we all agree that uh, Bitcoin maybe has a 0.5 to 1% uh, of the total population. So I think when we talk about adoption and reaching critical mass, we have to realize that to reach a tipping point, typically it's between 5 and 10%. So I think we're not, we're not that far away. I think we're probably 5 to 10x. So sometimes when we talk about adoption, we talk about like we have to convince the majority of the world, but I think it's just a 5 or 10%. I think if we all reach our family and friends, sisters, best friends, we're doing them a favor, 
and we'll reach our tipping point. That's it. Thank you. Hey, Gary. Thanks for having me up. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the technical and development side of, of UTXO management, which is basically um, something we're considering as far as, you know, when the price gets to a certain amount, um, it will limit people on, on, on that self-custody aspect, which I understand as far as adoption, that, that doesn't, um, you know, move the needle. But I think it really does move the needle in people who are Bitcoiners and, and eventually want to move from centralized to self-custody once they have gotten through the adoption. So, uh, the, the technical and development side that I've been listening to a lot lately is 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 concerned about the UTXO side of things and, and having each person in the in the world be able to own a UTXO and self custody if they so wish to. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to the conversation because I am working on two circular economies similar to what's happening in Bitcoin Beach. Um, you can find them in my profile. It's Bitcoin Victoria Falls in Zambia and Bitcoin Montserrat in the Caribbean. Um, those are my two kind of philanthropic projects that I'm kind of bringing to the table. But I think as far as a global and, and once we, what, if we do consider, you know, the people in this world who don't have um, the financial, uh, you know, uh, wherewithal, um, their ability to self-custody if they wish is an important long-term, um, you know, uh, goal uh, of, of the Bitcoin development uh, team. So just wanted to... Adam, I think we got most of that. Your 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 connection's not great, but uh, you ought to hook up with Sam. Uh, see if there's any synergy between what Sam's doing on political front, because I think that's that's to me the risk there is okay, or the government's going to allow it, but most certainly the technology um, is going to change to to make self custody easier. I mean, it's just early days, I think. Yeah, man. Give me a follow. Let's uh, DM. Well, Sam, if nobody else has anything, I think uh, we'll wrap up. This was second or third time you've done this with me. Hey, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to pop in. I appreciate you guys having me up. Is that okay? Sure, go ahead, man. Okay, uh, just on the food security thing, I just wanted to uh, recommend. I have, I know Bitcoin being ultimately about freedom in our financial world um that that being the center point of that and having full um you know say so of what we're doing with our coins so i think uh on the food security uh, look into food forest abundance there's a company out of central florida they're doing a cool project called galt's landing basically making uh permaculture design on people's properties and uh creating sovereign communities taking care of each other um taking the power back and providing that value um together and uh they're all, they're doing it around the globe um it's basically providing a service to take your property and turn it into a a food forest passively growing um where it's going to take less input um and you're going to get clean nutrient dense food so i just wanted to throw that out there and that's in uh, central florida yeah, there's a cool there's a cool project going on called Galt's Landing in Central Florida, and where it's like a big sovereign community. Uh, Jim Gale is the is the founder, and he's just a just an awesome dude. But um, they're doing some really cool stuff, and so I'm in Northern California, but I'm spreading that mission, kind of helping, being an ambassador for that, growing growing stuff, and turning my property into that, and showing kind of what we can do by uh setting these setting these systems up on our property and uh giving us food yeah man uh shoot me a dm happy to talk i will for sure sam thank you man anyway buddy i was asking you thank you for that flex i was asking you has this been enjoyable i mean it, your community's got to be getting bigger uh, hey, on that, guys, there's about 500 people in this room. If you're not following me or Sam, it would be really helpful if you did. It really blows the community up. So uh, if you could follow us, it'd be awesome. We will bring more education. We attempt to do that and want questions and answers. I think it really gets a, a good debate, a good, healthy debate is the best way for me to learn, uh, even if I'm in the audience listening to that. And I think the more logical we can be. Uh, with with a, a diverse number of uh, viewpoints is really really awesome. That's what we're trying to do. Sam, has it been fun so far? Or you hate oh it? yeah, I love it. Uh, it's like a, it's like a free education a lot of times because even if 
you'll get someone who will pop up here and ask one question. You're like, whoa, I wasn't thinking about that at all. Um, so it's just a good way to diversify your your point of view and way of thinking because you, whether you intend to or not, everyone and I think kind of ends up in their own silos and bubbles. And this is a great way to break that. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, it's been really lovely having you on the team, and I like working with you. So, well done. You guys follow this cat. He's a, he's a cool young man. He's going to be somebody that you will know. I I predict I predict we'll know Sam in the future. You'll know, you'll see him in the public eye. So, all right, guys. Well, if we don't have anything else, Must, you got you want to say how great of a show this was, man? Closing comment. Yeah, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Uh, uh, you guys uh, put on a great show. I always pop in on these whenever I get a chance. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a question, on your thoughts on this, Gary. Um, I feel like a lot of people are turned off by Bitcoin because they think they perceive it to be as too expensive. Um, what are your thoughts on normalizing Satoshis as a unit of account rather than Bitcoin so people can actually see that you don't actually have to have a whole one? That you that it, that it, that can be you know divided up into a hundred million. Yeah, well, they do it in tokens every day, dude. I mean, maybe if you turn this whole thing into a Satoshi token, and uh, people would just flood into it because they can buy it for point zero 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 seven. Uh, I still think that's about a bad education issue, and uh, yeah. it is a phenomenon that occurs. People like price over value. The cool thing about Bitcoin for me is that I would rather take someone, a family, and say, hey, how would you like to own your own franchise for $70,000? If I could show you a franchise that had very little risk, no tax, no regulations, nobody looking up your ass, no boss, no anything, would you invest $70,000 in a franchise? And I think most families are going to say, what do I need to do to find $70,000? I, yeah, I, uh, it's an apart. It's look. It's a. It's a. It's an apartment building play for legacy families that want to create a legacy. That actually want to store their wealth, and most people want to run their own business. This is what I hear all the time. I hate having a boss. I hate having clients. I don't like tenants. Tenants bitch. Tenants leave. Right. I want to run my own business. Uh, you guys got rich running your own business. All right. Buy Bitcoin, dude. Go to work. It's your shitty job. Buy Bitcoin. Let it appreciate. Keep buying Bitcoin. And you're basically using the mentoree job that you're getting. You're an apprentice. If you're working at Kmart, I'm working at Kmart, dude. Put in three more hours at Kmart and just produce fiat. Turn that into Bitcoin. And you're going to own a business that's going to be worth a shitload more than you thought it was going to be. And you don't have any organizational skills or management skills required. And Gary, and you know what? And you have thousands of employees. Like right now, Gary, you're working for Bitcoin, right? So whoever... Yeah, owns but every, Bitcoin, everybody's on the same team, dude. Exactly. Totally. I am team Bitcoin. I'm exactly. a monster cheerleader for Bitcoin. I'm not getting paid for this, dude. Except the whole... Except I am because I'm meeting you people. Like, when I was doing natural gas, dude, I was slinging more natural gas on this planet than anybody I know. Uh, we didn't have these little three-hour round-top table conversations, people all over the world. That is really, really cool to me over this subject matter. And I'm not showing up to virus shows and war shows, but this subject matter seems to bring in a lot of gravity. And uh, a lot, like you said, dude, a lot of free... free Dedicated employees. Plus, uh, I think British makes this point that when you're, I think in real estate, he, he was part of, so, of that industry, um, you kind of, uh, you have competitors, right? If you have a good deal, you're not going to tell your competitors, hey, I found this great deal, because he'll go and get it for, before you, right? But here we're totally. all, here we, we benefit from each other the more we learn from each other the better network we become the stronger we become the more we succeed together i think that's the difference agreed well guys we're going to close out tonight um thank you very much sam any closing comments otherwise i'm going to 
leave the stage. No, this was great. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, everybody who came up and asked questions and spoke. Thanks, buddy. Great, great doing it. Thanks, all. Really appreciate it. Have a great week, man.